This morning, we're in Psalm 17 today, Psalm chapter 17, so you find that. We're in the book of Psalms last Sunday, and we're there again this morning, but that's all right. Psalm 17, and to give you a moment to find that, the largest book in the Bible, just about in the center of most Bibles, chapter 17. And uh, I'm going to really be focusing on a text here, so I want to read a couple of verses with you after you find it there. Give you a moment. Psalm 17, let's stand together in honor of God's Word. I'm going to start with verse 1. Follow along in your book there. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Then at verse number 6. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. Show thy marvelous loving kindness. O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. I want to draw your attention to that little phrase at the beginning of verse 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness. And I want to speak to you this morning on God's marvelous loving kindness. Father in heaven, we love you and we rejoice in your love for us. And not just in your love, but your loving kindness. Speak to our hearts, O God, please. Fill both speaker and listener with your spirit. May we, Lord, be helped this morning, draw people to the Lord Jesus, all of us. May we be closer to Him than when we came in this morning, I pray in Christ's name, and amen. You may be seated. Let me encourage you to keep your Bible open. We're going to go to three other chapters in the book of Psalms. One of the great things about our God is His personal knowledge, His personal interest, and His personal care that He has and shows to each one of His children. I like what the songwriter wrote when he wrote the words, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. 
for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I love that. We're in God's thoughts, and the very hairs of our heads are all numbered. You know what that means, folks? We have a very personal and caring and knowledgeable, close, heavenly Father. And that's a wonderful thing. When you consider that He is the God of all creation, created it all, makes it all stay together, makes it all function, and yet He has time for me and you, that's remarkable. At the same time, we don't want to forget that He's a very big God. And His right hand, the Bible says, spans the heavens. There is something There's nothing small about our God except for His care and His concern for us. Many times in the Bible, when God is spoken of or spoken about, He is mentioned using, the Bible using superlative terms. Superlative. Now, I am sure that for most people in this room, English was not your favorite subject. All right? And it wasn't mine either. A superlative is an adjective that describes the highest kind. Uh, the highest quality, surpassing all others, supreme. Some of the synonyms uh, would be, some of the synonyms for our superlatives are excellent and wonderful and marvelous and magnificent and other such type words. Those are what we call superlative words. And truly, God is rightly defined by all of those terms. And we find God defined in the superlative in this chapter. And in verse number 7, where the Bible says, what the Bible tells us, that God is not just a God of love. He is not just a God of kindness. He is a God of loving kindness. A special kind of kindness. And it's not just a, a, just a normal loving kindness. He is a God who is a God of marvelous, loving kindness. That's a superlative term about our God. His marvelous, loving kindness. Now, loving kindness is a word that uh, is used 21 times in the book of Psalms. It's used five other places, four in Jeremiah, one in Hosea. It was used 21 times in the writers of the songs. The Psalms used that term 21 times about God. And it's kindness with deep, deep love. It's tender mercies. It's tender regard. It's something that God has and God is and God shows to His people. Loving kindness. This psalm, if you have it at the top of your, in your, the, the titles of the psalms in your Bible, it is a prayer of David. So it was probably prayed during the time when Saul was chasing David. He refers to his enemies and those that would uh, do him harm. So probably that time in David's life when he was being chased by his enemies. You look at verse number 6. He says, I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. So he was in one of those times in his life when he had great confidence in his prayers. Great confidence that God would hear and answer his prayers. Let me just, this is not the message this morning, but let me come aside to say this, folks. There were other times in David's life when he did not have such confidence. Oh, more than one time, more than one occasion, David wrote, Be not silent to me, O God. He wasn't sure if his prayers were being heard or not. So what's your point, Pastor? My point is this. There's no difference in you and me and David. We're human beings. We're not robots. We're not mechanically operated. Sometimes we pray with great confidence, knowing, feeling that God is listening, God is hearing, and God is going to answer. And I've got a tug on the other end of the line. And there's somebody listening to my prayer. And there's other times that we pray when we do not, we do not, uh, we don't feel that confidence. But you know what the key is, folks? The key is to just keep on praying. Just keep on praying. 
Pray till the light breaks through. And David's praying here with great confidence in, the, in his prayer life. And in verse number 7, David asked God, you, show, you see it there, Get, David asked God to show me, Lord, show me your marvelous, loving kindness. And folks, God is able to show His marvelous, loving kindness because He is marvelously loving kind. That's what He is. God is that kind of God. Now, I want to say several things about God this morning as it applies to His loving kindness. Because God is marvelously loving, has this marvelous loving kindness, I want to say, number one, that we can trust Him. We can trust Him. Turn in your Bible to chapter 36. We're in the book of Psalms. Chapter 36 to another psalm written by David. Psalms, if you're getting familiar with your Bible, Psalms are songs. Songs. That's what the word psalm mean. means. So David was a songwriter. And he wrote in chapter 36, again, verse number 7. Look at it here. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. So not only is his loving kindness marvelous, his loving kindness is excellent. David is the pen of this psalm. And again, he is speaking in the superlative about God. In chapter 17, he said, God, your loving kindness is marvelous. And now he says, your loving kindness is excellent. And look at what he says the rest of the verse. Because it is excellent, therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Because God is excellently loving and kind, has this excellent loving kindness we can trust Him. My mind goes back to years gone by. When the kids were toddlers. You take that little 20-month-old or 2-years-old child, put them on the counter in the kitchen or on some other elevated place, put them up there and watch them kind of and say, come on. Come on, jump. Jump. Boy, they're looking at you, and you know, kids have different personalities. Some kids, you hardly got the word jump out of your mouth. Boom, they were off the thing. Other kids, not so. You know, they're looking at you, and like, there's a great gulf fixed here, buddy. You know, and they're trying to make all this happen in their mind. And come on, come on, come on, come on. Daddy loves you. Daddy loves you. Daddy, Daddy what? Yeah, Daddy loves you. Why do they jump? Because they know they trust their daddy. Daddy's not going to let me fall to the ground. Why do they trust their daddy? Because they know daddy loves me. Daddy loves me. You probably did the same thing at your house, and your kids probably responded the same way. Multiple children, maybe some jumped immediately, and others it took a little time. But eventually they all jumped. That's because they all trusted Daddy or Mom, if Mom would do it. And they trusted parents, they trusted Dad and Mom, because they knew that their parents loved them. Now listen very carefully. Here's my point this morning, folks. Nothing comes into the life of one of God's children that's by accident. Nothing comes into the life of one of God's children by coincidence. I don't believe that for a second. We use the word coincident. We use the word accident. We use that word. I'm not against using those terms. But nothing comes into the life of a child of God by coincidence or by accident. God allows circumstances and God allows situations to come into our lives that are unpleasant and uncomfortable. He allows that. Most people are familiar, at least a little bit, with the story of Job in the Old Testament. The Bible says in the first chapter of the book of Job, there came a day. There was a day. On earth, literal earth, literal man named Job, living some millenniums before you and me, there was a day on earth when Job had everything taken from him by the hand of Satan. His cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, his camels, his servants, 
and all ten of his children one morning. Gone. There was a day on earth. There came a day on earth when that happened. But friend, before the Bible says there came a day on earth, the Bible says in the same chapter there came a day. There was a day in heaven. Now don't lose the train of thought. There was a day on earth where everything Job had was taken. But before that day on earth ever took place, there was a day in heaven where God gave His permission for that to happen. The day in heaven preceded the day on earth. God allowed it. God permitted it. Job was not some superhuman, robot, mechanical person. He was a man made in the same image with the same passions that you and I have. How would you feel if all of your children were taken from you in one morning? How would you feel if all of your possessions were taken from you in one morning? You'd probably, you know, survive the possessions more than you would the children. But my point is this. When things like, and nobody here has gone through, that I know of, has gone through something close to what Job went through. But folks, on whatever level, to whatever degree, unpleasant and uncomfortable circumstances or situations come into my life or your life, we have to remember that we can trust Him. You know why? Because He is a God of marvelous Loving kindness. I'm sure Job struggled. I know Job struggled. You can read about his struggle in the Bible. Job struggled. He said, God, why was I even born? Why did I ever see the light of day? Why didn't I die in my mother's womb? The pain was so intense. The pain was so deep. He wished he had never lived. It was that tough. But in the end, Job landed on his feet by saying this in chapter 13 and verse 15, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So through it all, at the end of it all, through all of the pain, all of the inner hurt, all of the... Folks, do you, you think Job ever questioned why? There are thousands of unanswered questions about circumstances and situations that come into our lives. Thousands of them. But when it was, and we may never know the full reason until we get to heaven. But we can all land on our feet like Job did and say, you know, say, you know what? In the end, I will trust God. And the reason I'll trust Him is because He is a God of marvelous loving kindness. And you can trust somebody who loves you. God is so lovingly kind, so full of tender mercy and favor, we can trust Him fully. I've been thinking about some of you the past seven or eight days and here in the church, and some of you have recently gone through some sort of personal upheaval in your life. It might be physical. It might be financial. It might be uh, vocational. I'm thinking about guys that lost their jobs recently. I'm thinking about maybe it's something, some upheaval emotionally. Or maybe it's a spiritual uh, battle that you're in. Maybe it's a relational upheaval. There's some kind of a relationship that's just in turmoil. And the thing that Satan would love to see and love to hear more than anything is you losing confidence in your God. He would love that. I'm not saying you shouldn't hurt. I'm not saying you shouldn't weep. I'm not saying that you shouldn't even look toward the heavens once in a while and say, 
Why? But I am saying that at the end of the day, when you land on your feet, I hope that you will say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He's this God of marvelous, loving kindness. David said that men who trust him, look at the end of the verse, put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. You know what a, a, the, you know what a shadow produces? A shadow is essentially shade, isn't it? You're working out in the heat of the day. The heat gets intense. Maybe the wind is blowing fiercely. And the hot sun burning down on you. My goodness, I remember being on my hands and knees going through tomato patches in Tennessee in the valley in August. No wind whatsoever. The sun and the humidity just beating down on us all day long. Pickings to tomatoes, 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 tomatoes. So much so that your arms turn green. And at the end of the day, probably four or five o'clock in the afternoon, I mean the sweat, the soil is just caked on us. And here's a little stream going through the valley and trees that line that stream. And Mike said, boys, go get you some shade. Went under there and got underneath the shadow of those trees. Boy, it wasn't air conditioned, but the shade just kind of sheltered us from the heat. You with me? So for the brother who texted me or called last week and said, just pray for me, it's pretty tough at work right now. And for the, for the woman who's had some kind of upheaval in her life, there's a little bit of relief from the intensity of the heat in the shade of the shadow of his wings. Don't you run from Him. Run to Him. Because He's a God of marvelous loving kindness, we can trust Him. I love the song once in a while. I think the brag tree, Brother Mike, maybe you and your sister and wife sing this once in a while. Let me get that in the right order. You and your wife and your sister. Amen. Get that in the right order. You sing the song, I can trust Jesus. I can trust Jesus. He never once has failed to meet my need. He is my strong tower, my strength in my weakest hour. I can trust Jesus. He takes care of me. <laughs> when are you going to ask me to join your court? Amen. 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 <laughs> Marvelous loving kindness. And because He is, you can trust Him. But there's a second thing we find. Look to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Turn a few pages over to your right. Psalm 119. And look at verse number 149 with me here in that long chapter. Because of His loving kindness, we can trust Him. Because of His loving kindness, we can talk to Him. I love this. Psalm 119, 149. Here's what the psalmist wrote. David is not the pen. We don't think of this particular psalm, but still, it's in the songbook called Psalms. 119, 149. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness. So the psalmist said, hear me, God. And the reason I'm asking you to hear me is because of your loving kindness. Father, I need to talk to you. You know, people, it's a great relationship when your child will come to you and say, Dad or Mom, can we talk? That's a great relationship, isn't it? And kids have to be trained and coerced and brought to that place. Sometimes it's awkward for them. You know, and sometimes because a dad has an especially uh, explosive temper, uh, maybe he's unapproachable, maybe he's an unreasonable man, and kids are very reluctant to go talk to their dad. They're actually afraid of talking to him because they don't know what to expect. You know, I, man, I wasn't the perfect father. I was far from it. I got to confess that there were some times when the kids came to talk to me and I, I, I lost my cool. 
I never smacked anybody. Wanted to a couple of times. But never hit anybody. And I look back on that. And even then, you know, when it was all said and done, I just, I, I you know what I thought about this week when I was putting this sermon together? It was that deer, deer camp, that the deer hunting. We won't even go into that. This, it's, it's amazing this kid ever talked to me again. <laughs> I lost my cool. Crazy. My wife never did. To this day, those kids talk to her. They talk to me, but they talk to her. They always look forward to talking to Joyce. Always. David, the psalmist, wanted to talk to God. Thank the Lord. Our Heavenly Father is not an unreasonable Father. He does not have an explosive temper. He is not an unapproachable being. He is very reasonable. He is very approachable. And you know why, folks? Because of His loving kindness. Because of His loving kindness. In fact, it's God's loving kindness that the psalmist appeals to when he prays. Look at the wording of verse number 149. You've got a Bible. Look at it. Hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness. You know what the psalmist is not doing? He is not approaching God saying, Lord, I, I need to talk to you. And listen, uh, please hear me because you know how good I've been. And you know how faithful I am. And you know how much I serve, and you know how much I sing, and you know how much I give. And so, Lord, because of all the things that I've kind of piled up around me that are real good, would you please listen to it? He didn't go to God based on his own merit. He went to God asking God to hear him because God's a marvelously, lovingly kind God. Can I give you a little advice, friend? When you need to talk to God and ask Him for a favor, uh, don't go to Him with a list of, look what I've done. Because what that's saying is, God, you should listen to me based on who I am, what I've been, what I've done. Well, guess what? In some cases, we wouldn't even begin to pray, would we? <laughs> when you need something, when you need to talk to your Father, you talk to Him on the basis of His loving kindness. God, I need to talk to You. And because You are a God of loving kindness, would You hear me? You know what you're asking God for? A favor. God doesn't owe us anything. He owes nothing. The Lord is debtor to no man. God is never in my debt. Now, sometimes you say to people, people do you a favor and do things for you, and you say to them, hey, I'm in your debt. I owe you something. But God is debtor to no man. <laughs> Look, God saved us, wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. We don't ever have to worry about splitting hell wide open. One worry about that. He owes us anything beyond... <laughs> That is just a special benefit. You don't even know it's that. Now, a couple of people here have asked me, and, and a couple of people other places that I've been recently have asked me, hey, how are your kids doing over in Madagascar with this bubonic plague? And, and you know, first time I heard it, I thought, well, you know, Madagascar is a dirty place. And then the second time I heard it, you know, I thought, well, you know, Ben's not said anything. Third time I heard it. And then Friday, Ashley's dad called. Now, usually when Ashley's dad calls me, it's a father-in-law wanting to talk to a son-in-law because he's concerned for his daughter and the grandchildren. So when Brother Finn calls me, we visit for a little bit. Now, Brother Terry says, I don't want to bother you with anything, but uh, what do you know about this bubonic plague over in Madagascar? Ninety-four people have died. It's, there's two forms of it. There's a bubonic plague. There's a pneumonic plague. And the pneumonic plague is more dangerous than the bubonic plague. And they closed the schools. Schools have been closed for three weeks. I didn't know that. 
Somebody told Brother Finn that they weren't having church services. That's not true, but they are. The government is considering closing down the public, any kind of public or general assembly because of the spread of this plague. It's horrible. And so, you know, after I talked to Brother Finn, I called Ben. And Brother Finn said, he said, Terry, he said, the Mormon church has had their missionaries leave. I said, whoa. So I called Ben. How are you doing, Ben? I said, talk to me about this bubonic plague, man. Talk to me about it. He said, just a minute. He put his earphones in. Put his, and I know what he's doing. He's walking. He's not going to talk in front of the kids. He's not going to talk in front of the girls. He said, well, Dad, it's pretty serious. I said, well, the Mormon church had their missionaries come home. He said, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> the eternal optimist. I said, I appreciate that, son. <laughs> really, you know, if you get it, uh, hey, but if Ashley and the girls get it, and if those girls get it, Paul Paul's concerned. And I'm concerned for all of them. And they can't get masks. Masks are gone. They, everybody's bought all the masks up. So they quarantined the country. They shut the airport. They said they, they, that, they threw that out one statement. You know, maybe the airport might have to be. I said, then you're in. You're stuck in. He said, we got antibiotics in the house. He said, you can fight it with antibiotics. If you get them on antibiotics the first 12 or 24 hours, you can, you can fight it. We've got both antibiotics here. We're being careful. The girl washing, washing hands, washing hands. But some of it's transmitted through the air. And so we talked. I said, well, just be careful, bud. He said, yeah, we are. We're being very, we're being very careful. You get up and you hang up and 10,000 miles away. How do you pray for that? You know, I want, I want, to, I want to take a, a, buy a case of masks and, and run to Madagascar, but I can't do that. And I'm not going to pay $2,400 to fly them there and to get them there. If there's a shortage, they may never make it out of the post office. So what do you do? Oh, God, been serving you for 42 years. <clears throat> Just to remind you, I've been a good boy the past month. And I got this church, and you know, I got this family, and you know, Lord, I read my Bible, and so now I need you. I need a favor from you to take care of those kids, because I'm not there. And Lord, you know, look at me. Is that how you pray? You say, God, you don't owe me a thing, but I sure do need a favor. <laughs> I need a favor. And because, because you're a God of marvelous, loving kindness, would you watch after those kids? Whew. That goes a lot further than trying to impress him with flawed obedience. Because the very best of our obedience is flawed. I take Joyce out for a meal together. I put my cell phone on silent. And I don't refer to it and if it starts buzzing. It, only if it's one of the kids. And she knows that and doesn't bother. And why, would I, why would I carry my cell phone, put it on silent, and ignore everything else except for one of the kids? Because I'm their father. And I love them. And we have a lovingly kind, marvelously loving kind God that we can talk to. And when we talk to Him and need a favor, hallelujah, He is a God of marvelous loving kindness. We can trust Him. We can talk to Him. Number three, we need to think on His loving kindness. Look at chapter 48, verse number 9. Chapter 48, verse number 9. We're in good shape. I'm almost done. Chapter 48, verse number 9. I love this, and I won't be long on this point. Because of His loving kindness, we need to think on His loving kindness. Look at chapter 48, verse number 9. We have thought of Thy loving kindness, O God. In the midst of thy temple. 
Now, you know, folks, we can spend, so we get into circumstances and situations that are uncomfortable and unpleasant, and we can spend all of our mental energy and even physical energy, stress, thinking about the whys and the maybes and the how comes, and let those things bounce around in our mind like a ping pong ball, or we can just stop that and think about, you know what, I've got a Heavenly Father full of marvelous loving kindness. And I want you to notice where the psalmist said he was when he thought of God's marvelous loving kindness. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. That's one reason, people, why it is good to go to church even when you're going through tough circumstances. Even when you're going through difficult situations, you go to church. And boy, it's so easy in church to be reminded of His loving kindness. To get it on your mind, the singing and the fellowship and the preaching, there's something about it that draws our attention at times to how lovingly kind our God is. And you know, the truth of the matter is, when we think on His loving kindness, we'll be moved to talk to Him and ask according to His loving kindness. And if we, and then if we talk to Him, it's obviously that we trust Him. He's, because of His marvelous loving kindness, we should trust in Him. Because of His marvelous loving kindness, we should talk to Him. Because of His mar- marvelous loving kindness, we should think on that. But I want to say last of all, look at Psalm 88. Psalm 88, we're done. I'm going to have to leave some of this out. But Psalm 88, verse number 11. I want to say last of all that God's loving time, kindness has a time limit. God's loving kindness has a time limit. Look at chapter 88 and verse number 11. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Now, folks, if God's loving kindness is going to be declared, it will have to be done by people before the grave. Those who die apart from Jesus Christ never experience His loving kindness on earth. And they will never experience it in the grave. It's too late. There may be a person here this morning, you've never been with the Bible, calls born again. You've been to church, you believe in God, but you've never been born again. And until you're born again into God's family, where God becomes your heavenly Father, it's difficult to really know and experience His marvelous loving kindness. But once you get saved, boy, oh boy, oh boy, God is a God of marvelous, excellent, loving kindness. I spoke at a youth conference rally, conference rally slab, uh, for Brother Grimaldi uh, Friday night and Saturday and Friday night we had a tremendous service. They had the biggest crowd they've ever had in a good spirit. Boy, the teenagers just jumped in, participated. and It makes such a difference when teenagers participate instead of having to be drug into everything. I noticed the boy sitting in the back. It was obvious that he was a visitor. He paid attention during the message, and I preached a little bit at the end of the message about salvation. And I noticed he was listening, and, 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 and I gave the invitation, and he didn't move. And that was where I was sitting. I had been sitting close to him in the poor part of the service. So when I finished the message and turned the invitation over to Brother Micah McCurry, I walked back there and took my seat in the row he was in. And I just slid over and I said, Hey, bud, what's your name? He said, Ryan, how old are you? I'm 14. Ryan, have you ever been born again? No, sir. Would you like to know how to be born again? Yes, sir. And I got to take Ryan back to a room and show Ryan, 14-year-old teenage boy, how he could put his faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ and be saved. And he did, and he was back the next morning for Saturday services with a smile on his face. I hope he stays with it going to church and stays in his Bible long enough to find out just how much there is to enjoy in having a marvelous, loving, kind Father. If you're not saved, what a great day to find out how loving kind He is.
Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the privilege of preaching this morning about your marvelous loving kindness. Now, O oh God, speak to the hearts of people in the room this morning as only you can. Please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the service is almost over, we're about to dismiss. But before we do, let me ask you just a couple of questions. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, but please listen. What if there's anybody here today, well, let me find this, that's this way. Who could say, Pastor Angel, for sure, I know I'm saved. I know I've been born again. I know heaven is my home. I'm saved and I know it. That's my testimony. I'm saved and I know it. Could you lift your hand, please, this morning? Thank you. Take your hands down. Is there somebody here this morning who would say, Pastor, I've listened to you preach about this loving kindness of this great God and how you can only experience it once you're born into His family. And I'm not sure that I'm born again. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Jim Vineyard went to take an afternoon nap yesterday, and at 5 o'clock he passed away in his sleep and woke up in heaven. If you passed away in your sleep tonight, where would you wake up? Do you know? Pastor, I'm not sure where I'm going when I die. I'd appreciate you just saying a brief prayer for me when you close in prayer. Would you slip your hand up in the air? Let me pray for you. I don't know for sure where I'm going when I die. Pastor Angel, just include me in your prayer. If anybody's like that here today, I'd like to have a closing prayer. Include, ask God to speak to your heart. And if you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven, there's a way that you can find out. You can have somebody show you from the Bible how to be saved. More than anything in all the world, we'd love to see you trust Christ this morning and be saved. Know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. What a great thing to go home knowing. In just a minute, we're going to stand. The music's going to begin to play. People are going to come pray. Why don't you slip out and come let somebody here in the front take a Bible and show you how to be saved. If you've been saved, you need to be baptized. Now's the time to come or join the church. Or if you just want to come to this altar and thank God, maybe you need to trust Him. Maybe you need to say to Him, God, help me to trust you because of His marvelous loving kindness. But you do what God wants you to do this morning. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father, bless the invitation to our hearts, please. Let's stand, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The ladies are playing a song of invitation. Let me invite you to leave your seat, come with the others. Let us take a Bible and show you how to be saved today. Would you come? We have ladies to show ladies how to be saved. We have men to show men. That's right, just step right out of the pew, come right on down. We'll show you how to be saved this morning. Would you come while we wait? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We have time. Love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Would you come this morning while we wait? Nobody's looking. It's personal. I encourage you to come.